Hello and welcome back to America's Forum. I'm John Bachman. I'll try to struggle through. JD is off today, but we'll do our best uh, to give you the news you need to keep you informed throughout the day. Let's talk about the Ukraine a little bit. A Ukrainian fighter jet, as you can see right here, flew over the city of Slovyansk today after armored vehicles drove into the city flying Russian flags. One car spun in circles in the center of the city as crowds looked on and local pro-Russian Ukrainians took photographs of armed men with masks. Some of the troops said that they were Ukrainian soldiers. They've switched sides. That's what they're telling us. Pro-Russians in Slovyansk have seized the local police headquarters and the administration building there. They're demanding border autonomy for the eastern Ukraine, broader autonomy for the eastern Ukraine, and closer ties with Russia. This as NATO strengthens its military presence along Ukraine's eastern border in response to Russia's aggression. NATO estimates Russia still has close to 40,000 troops on Ukraine's eastern border and could invade parts of the country within days if they wanted to, maybe if they haven't already in some ways. Lisa Ruth is joining us right now, former CIA officer. Lisa, it's always great to see you. Thanks, John. All right, so there's been a lot of options talked about here, and some of the things that the administration has tried up until this point, the sanctions and things of that nature, clearly don't seem to be working. Vladimir Putin seems intent on gaining more of Ukraine. Uh, we've heard also that there is one clear, simple solution coming from Charles Krauthier uh, floating this idea that it's now is the time to immediately arm uh, the Ukrainian troops and bring more NATO presence. We, we're doing that to a, a certain degree, but will that be the thing that stops Vladimir Putin? Is that even an option? I would think at this point it is an option. You know, as you look at it, as, as you said, we've tried the sanctions, nothing happens. We've tried tough talk. We've kicked him out of the group of eight. We've done a lot of other things, but nothing has, has happened yet. Military action, I think, would make a difference. As, as you and I have spoken, no matter what Putin is, he does not really want to engage in a war with NATO or, or anyone else. Now, that said, we are very, very close to a civil war here now. Things are escalating dramatically and very, very quickly. And the question will be how much we go, we go in, how fast and where. And so there was some talk about these reports of Ukrainian troops switching sides, whether that was valid or not, or whether this was Putin sending in Russian troops to act like they were defectors. But you think that could be the case here, and that could be kind of the starting point for this civil war. I, I think it could be the case. What we've seen, if you look around Ukraine right now, there's a lot of posters up, people blaming the government in Kiev for what's happening now, hmm. not being able to take control from these separatists. There's a lot of concerns about troops not getting paid. The government in Kiev is absolutely under pressure. We know that, economic pressure, there's all kinds of pressure. I think Russia is playing this very, very smartly all the way across the board, military, but they could be giving money. We don't know. If hmm. they're paying off these military troops who aren't getting money from the government, why not? Yeah, well, you know, when you got your family to feed at home, where does your loyalty lie? That's the question, I guess. Um, you know, but still, it's tr troubling nonetheless. And, and we've also talked in the past about the Cold War uh, intelligence structure that once existed, and I'm not quite as robust as it is now. Um, and you were, you know, a colleague of yours were kind of joking about what might need to happen if we're going to continue what we once used to do in this region. Right. As you said, uh, my colleague was saying we're going to have to roll out some wheelchairs and get the Cold War guys back out because we have not thought about Russia this way for a long time. And it's tempting to say this administration is at fault. Certainly it has continued a mm. policy. But really since the fall of the Soviet Union, we have not looked at Russia as a huge threat. Our, our emphasis has been elsewhere. This I think shows that Russia is a threat. Yeah, and you know, you look specifically at the uh, the missiles that were supposed to be in Poland and then transitioned into placed into Turkey, uh, but not we're not talking about the same objective for those missiles, right? Because the missiles that were placed into Turkey were supposed to intercept missiles perhaps coming from Iran, someplace else. The missiles that were supposed to be placed in Poland were to intercept intercontinental ballistic missiles from Russia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, w I guess we need both sets of missiles here, right? It sure seems that way. You know, one of the questions I would think intelligence community now is really scrambling to look mm -hmm. at what resources we have, how we can mobilize them, maybe change, again, as you said, the idea behind them. What do we need and how can we protect our allies and, and ourselves. All right, we, we talked about the, the wheelchair uh, strategy here to, to, to make light of the situation, which you don't mean to do, but, you know, so if that were to happen, we, you know, a lot of folks are, are adverse to the idea of arming uh, the, the troops on the ground that aren't U.S. forces. Nobody likes that idea in, in Syria. It, was, it seemed complicated at the time. This is a different situation. I mean, we've seen the vice president go to Kiev. It's, it seems like there would be an opportunity to get people who know who the right folks are to get these weapons to. And of course, the Ukrainian government is established 
as well. So a different situation. Do you think that's a po that's a possibility? I think it's Do a possibility. I think it would be difficult. How long would it take to r to ramp up to that point where we had enough U.S. intelligence on the ground in that area to make sure that we were picking the right sides? I, I don't know. You know, how you look at it, it's hard to imagine that we were fully prepared for this. If we had great intelligence sources on the ground, you would think we would have been able to, to see this coming and maybe taken better steps. So that does raise some questions about how good our intelligence is. In terms of arming the population, I just read a quote from the uh, defense uh, minister or the deputy defense minister in Ukraine talking about the fact that the weapons that they have are Russian weapons. The training is in Russian weapons, that even to upgrade their weapons, they need spare parts from Russia. So you would be talking about whole new weapon systems coming in. It, again, you say it may be easier than Syria, which certainly is incredibly complicated. I don't know how easy that would be. All right, well, excellent point here. And we'll leave the Ukraine here for a second, because I also want to talk to you while we have you here about a, a whole other subject that we, we got into earlier on the show here. We were talking about the spike, uh, Chad Jenkins, uh, the FBI counterterrorism expert and former Army Ranger. We were talking about the rise of Al Qaeda affiliated groups in the Middle East, also in Africa as well, Boko Haram, uh, we were mm -hmm. talking about. Um, here in Yemen, we have this very public meeting that took place. Images now are getting out. Um, the number two Al Qaeda guy out there in the public. And, and I, and I kind of speculated, I guess, with Chad about the, you know, we seem to be in the worst case scenario where we lack the people on the ground to make the, the, the right intelligence calls, but we're also moving away from the drone program so these terrorists feel like they can operate out in the public. Is that what's, are we in a worst case scenario? I, I absolutely think so. And you and I have spoken in the past about lack of intelligence sources and the difficulty of the terrorist target. And without intelligence, we're operating blind. And I think they know it. You know, as you said, they certainly don't seem at all concerned about being out there very, very publicly. And without good intelligence, without good intelligence for the drone program either, I don't think you see a whole lot of concern on the, on the hands, on the side of the terrorists right now. And Mike Rogers, the outgoing chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, talked about a missed opportunity here. And there's some criticism, again, for the intelligence apparatus. Why did they not know that this group of uh, Al-Qaeda terrorists was meeting in mass in Yemen? In, in you know, what's the answer? Uh, my guess is, uh, and again, I, I keep saying the same thing, when you cut off intelligence resources, when you cut off funding, when you cut off ability to operate, you can't then say, why didn't you know this? Well, we didn't know it because we don't have the resources to deploy. Terrorist targets are really, really hard. It takes a very long time to recruit terrorists, to recruit terrorist sources. Mm. And at the point when you break that chain, it takes years and years and years to get it back. My guess is, is again, we're operating blind. I don't think we have the, the resources on the ground. And when you say you cut money and you cut funding, who are you talking about? I, it, absolutely, it's coming from the, the administrations. And again, not just this administration. We've seen it over time. We've seen it really since the church committee, that cutting back in how intelligence operates. We're seeing how how they've changed and really tried to restrain it. My guess is the Feinstein situation, we're going to see it pull back again. We're going to see the, the current spat in Congress between Congress and intelligence, we're going to see it pulled back again. And that's unfortunate, as we've heard J.D. talk about here. You know, of course, the intelligence situation, the NSA, the Edward Snowden affair, all contributing to that, but there might be other political motivations here at play with Senator Mark Udall appearing to look tough on this issue at least towards the NSA and the CIA. So troubling that politics could play a role here because we're seeing the real life impacts of what happens with this mass uh, meeting of Al-Qaeda Al leaders taking place in Yemen. And as we also pointed out, 1999, the USS Cole, where a lot of this uh, you know, very troublesome stuff kind of took flight, if you will. Absolutely. And we really got a gauge on how, much, how serious the situation is. Of course, much more to get here on America Forum. When we can return, the Republican National Committee is going after the IRS in court. Plus, Kathleen Sebelius, will she run for the Senate? We'll talk about those stories. Of course, it was great to have Lisa Ruth here with us to talk about uh, the international scene as well. Lisa, thanks for sticking around. Thanks, Don. All right. And uh, we want to hear from you as well. You can always reach out to us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, at Newsmax TV, the hashtag there, America's Forum. The email address, connect at NewsmaxTV.com. And then there's Facebook, Facebook.com backslash NewsmaxTV. We'll be back with more here on America's Forum on Newsmax TV right after this.